Welcome, everybody, to another edition of Turning Two with Booney. I'm the executive producer of this podcast, Rich Rare, of course, Brett Boone. Booney, how are you, bud? I am doing well. How are you, Rich? Um, come on, Booney. Let's get a little more energy today. We are in the middle of the season. I'm doing well. How are you, Rich? All right, let's go. That's yes. more like it. Uh, let's just get to the thing that everybody and their brother has been talking about, and it involves the Boone family. Your brother, Aaron ejected by Hunter Wendelstadt. So I'll set the story for everybody. Uh, Yankees are playing the Oakland Athletics and very first uh, hitter of the game, uh, controversial call, if you want to call it that, foul ball off the foot, uh, whether it hit him or not, foul tip. Anyway, didn't go the Yankees way. Yankees squawk a little bit. Hunter says, that's enough. I don't want to hear anything else from you, Aaron. Anybody else says anything in that dugout, you're gone. Aaron says, fine. So he's sitting there at the end of his dugout, looking at his nails, paying attention to the game, not saying anything to Hunter Wendelstadt. And all of a sudden, somebody yells something at the umpire, and he turns around and goes, Aaron, you're gone. And he ejects the younger of the two Boone brothers. The, the middle Boone brother gets, gets run. And it's now taken on this whole life of itself. I thought Aaron was very uh, diplomatic after the ball game, obviously frustrated for for getting thrown out of the game, more frustrated. They lost to the Oakland A's. Uh, Hunter said, listen, I told him, I don't want to hear anything else out of the dugout. Somebody said something, and uh, that's why I threw Aaron out of the ball game. And, and he explained, uh, we don't want to throw the players out. People spend money to see the players. So Aaron's responsible for what goes on in his dugout. So I think I got that all set up correctly. Brett, your reaction. Could you please expand on your question? <laughs> <laughs> Give me your thoughts. Um. I, I think it's hilarious that people make that big of a deal of it. I mean, it was like, okay, I mean, you set it up perfectly. It, it's the beginning of the game. Hunter's in one of those moods. He doesn't want to hear it. Aaron says a few words. He turns to Aaron. He said, listen, I don't want to hear another word, and I don't care if it's you. I don't care if it's your player. You're the captain of the ship. You're responsible for any other player that says a word in there. All the players heard it. Okay, the rule, the ground rules are set. Uh, the fan pops off. Hunter thinks it's coming from the dugout. Aaron, you're gone. Obviously, Hunter wasn't having a good day early in the day. He was in a real ornery mood. He throws Aaron. Aaron goes crazy. What do you mean? What do you mean? Uh, after the dust settled, Hunter made an obvious mistake. I'm sure Hunter woke up the next morning and thought, Okay. I, I didn't take all these things because, yes, it was the fan. Okay, Hunter Wendelstadt's going to get a slap on the wrist. Aaron's going to get no consequences, which he shouldn't. They'll move on. Aaron understands it was an honest mistake. It, put it behind you. It's really no no big deal. It's just more drama and a big misunderstanding. It was like an episode of Three's Company. A big misunderstanding. But I think everybody's fine. Now, Aaron, I thought, was very diplomatic because I watched his comments after the game. And he said, you know what? He said nothing else. I didn't say anything. It was the fan behind him. And Yes Network actually had a camera trained on Aaron. He was wearing his big red watch. He was standing there looking at his hands when he got run. He wasn't even looking at Hunter. Now, I also read Hunter's pull report after the game that said, I heard something on the far end of the dugout, is what Hunter is claiming now after, after it's all said and done. I heard something at the far end of the dugout. That's why I threw Aaron out of the ballgame. Now, because Yes Network had that camera trained on Aaron and they caught the fan over his shoulder, it looks like Hunter mistakenly heard the fan and gave the credit to Aaron, which ran him out of the ballgame. So let's go down the rabbit hole just a little bit, Brett. Explain to us what's allowed and what's not allowed during the course of a game getting on the umpire, riding the umpire, chirping at the umpire, where's the line? Well, it depends. Depends the the it depends the game, the importance of the game. Is it a postseason game? Is it a regular season game? Is it getaway day? What kind of mood is the umpire in? You you can't argue balls and strikes. That's always been the basic rule. You can't argue balls and strikes from the dugout. Now you can say something, they'll warn you that's enough. I don't want to hear another word. It's it's all subjective. It's all due to the umpire, his feelings, and what kind of mood he's in that day. Now, I think umpires will take into consideration the uh, 
the severity of the game, the importance of the game. If it's a if it's World Series game four, obviously they're going to have a much longer rope, especially with a player, because you, you don't want to be that umpire that kicks out a key player in a big game and and have to hear about that for the rest of your career especially if something goes sideways. So I think it's a pretty long rope with most players, most managers. Very rarely will an umpire look into a dugout, though. And, and here's what I was a little curious about. Very rarely will an umpire look into a dugout and, and talk to the manager and say, I don't care who says anything. If anybody says anything, you're getting thrown out talking to the manager. Rarely have I seen that in my years. Usually it's it's an isolated event and it's, whoever's saying it and the manager has nothing to do with it. But uh, in this, in this case, it was almost like we're in gym class in seventh grade, whoever says another word, all of us are running laps. So uh, I haven't really heard, heard that too often, but that's apparently what happened. Well, I think that's also a little new school because the, the umpires in the past, I think in your day would just turn around and go, Booney, you're out because he heard you chirping. Um, this one I thought was more nuanced because he said, Aaron, I'm going to throw you out because I'm not going to throw out one of the players because the people came money, uh, paid money to see the players, not you. I'm not going to throw Soto out. I'm not going to throw out any of your stars, right. but you are going to be thrown out, which I thought was a well, little it, different. Well, it was, it was kind of like, okay, I, I don't care what little Johnny does. Mr. Jones, if Johnny acts up again, you're going to be written up. You were the parent. You were responsible. So Aaron was the parent to the players, which to me at the big league level is a little silly. I understand all sides. So of it. what would you uh, rather have him do? Would you have rather run the player or run Aaron? Somebody's going to get run because they already told you that's enough. Well, Aaron, Aaron's going to say in his particular situation, run me every time. If right. my players got a problem with something, of course, run me out. Aaron can't do anything to win the game. Well, that's once that's the what, game starts. Once well, the game starts, the, the managers are relevant. Well, that's what we talk about. You know, Aaron gets run all the time because he stands up for his players. He's passionate about it. The one thing I will sure. say about Aaron Boone, anybody ever asked me, there is not a there is not a phony bone in Aaron Boone's in Aaron Boone's body. No, Aaron, when he's out there, when he's out there on the field, that is the real deal. He is the reincarnation of of Bob Boone with a little bit of Sue Boone, a little bit of his uh, his family lineage, and he ain't a phony. That's one thing you can always say about Aaron is he is legit when he goes out there and he's standing up for his players. No, without a doubt, without a doubt, and it's funny to watch. You know, he, he's, <laughs> it's like he's you know he's he, I, I flash back and I've told this story many times. It's when he argues. That's that's eight year old Aaron Boone arguing with me. And me telling him that that wiffle ball home run was foul. I know it's fair, but I, I got to get him going. I mean, it's the same kid <laughs> You're just right tormenting there. Him, right? Just just in a in an yeah, just in an adult body. So yeah, Aaron's <laughs> it's a hundred percent legit. There's no premeditation to any of Aaron's antics, but I do give him a hard time, and and I uh, you know I. I say, Aaron, we, we get it, man. You're, you're missed. Yeah. We, you love your players. You back them. We get it. All right. Point, point take it. Quit getting thrown out of the game. Quit, quit yelling about that little stupid box. I get back to the box again. Quit picking apart the box. That was a ball. That was a strike. Who cares? So I oh. give him a hard time about it, but he's going to do what he does. Okay. So you had Ted Barrett on this week. I thought it was brilliant. I enjoyed the conversation. Did you learn anything? Did you did you come away with anything new after talking with Teddy? Well, yeah, well, he just confirmed my my questions, my, and 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 I thought I knew the answer to it, but but pardon me for saying I'm tired of talking about it, but I, but I have to because I'm I'm falling, uh, I'm I'm becoming a victim of the box on on the broadcasts. And it's like if it hits that line, and, and I'm sick of hearing it from the from the commentators. I'm sick of hearing it from the play by play. It seems now that the whole game, all we talk about is the pitch. Oh, that was a ball, and he missed it. No, that's not necessarily the case. Teddy Teddy Barrett, what he did basically summed up is the umpires today are in a no win situation. They have this box that is constantly on every TV, every major league game that is that is out there. 
And the true strike zone that the umpires train on is different than that box. So, and they're for example, graded on. Right. He said he could have, uh, he could get back after a game, get his report on how he did on the on the true strike zone that the umpires behind the scenes train on, and he could have a perfect score. But on the telecast, that he could have missed four or five pitches according to did the ball hit the line or not. So he said. It's really a no-win situation because the public has no idea how we train. But the fact is, it's different than the box. And, and he said the box should be for entertainment purposes only. And I thought that was that was really uh, telling of what's going on. It's like we're giving you a false narrative of what the real strike zone is. But now all of a sudden, everybody in America and everybody on Twitter has become an excerpt expert because they can see it right in front of their eyes i think it's tough i really do think they need to take the box down it's starting to get it's taken over the game everything it's undermined is every single it's undermined it, the game. It's, it, you got to take that box away it's ridiculous okay so let me ask you this brett boone's up at the plate you you got a pretty good eye right you, you knew your strike zone pretty well i know my pitch strike that zone perfect <laughs> as every hitter will it, tell let, me no no but I say that it sounds arrogant. It's not. It's what we do. We right. know exactly what is a strike and exactly what is a ball. Not nope. Brett Boone. Any big league accomplished player, they know the strike zone and they know it really, really good. Uh, we, we've just taken so many pitches and in, in, in our mind, sure. we stand in the same spot. We know what a ball is and what a strike is. Uh, to the point of nauseam, just because we've done it so much. So, so it's part of your profession. Pretty much, you, most of the time, you're correct. I, I mean, it's not a perfect science. I can't get it down to millimeters, but I know what a ball is and what a strike is, and especially who's behind the plate. And the okay. players today, they're as good as they've ever been. What does an umpire tell you when it's a borderline pitch that he says strike? You say no way. Get, t tell me that exchange. Um, I, I know you don't you, turn around. I know you don't turn around and argue, but you are going to get your no, point. No, but across. I've got to. I've got to get my point across because I got to make him think about that he just missed a pitch. So the next time that pitch is in the same position, he thinks twice about about if I can convince him that he may have been wrong on a call. Next time that same pitch comes into play, he'll call it the correct way. Does that make sense? So yeah. I'm just setting up setting up the scenario for next time. So Very rarely. Very rarely will an umpire ever admit if I say that pitch is off the plate, you know, for example, this is a hypothetical Johnny. That's not a strike. That's off the plate. The typical Aunt Booney. Hey, it caught the corner. I thought it had enough of the edge. He's never going to say, ah, Brett, I missed that one ever, mm -hmm. ever. But he might now, say, ah, you know, I, I thought it was a good pitch. Is it going to be there all day? Is it going to be there all day? Is it going to be off the plate all day? That's my zone. Just That's let me know. usually the back and forth. Yes. Right. And and what I've been told by umpires, I'll ask, you know, if somebody turned, somebody wants to ask you a question, they'll go, hey, was that a strike? Which is what a yeah, lot of hitters will say. Yeah, but come on. Well, That's, no, pan That's pandering. Well, You're giving him too much power. You're going to tell the umpire, was that a strike, Mr. Umpire? No, no, no. no well, I'm, I'm going to tell you context. that's not. Wait a second. I'm, wait a second. Right. In the context. I'm, right. Remember, I'm I'm, I'm, you. You're looking at it from the hitter's perspective. I'm trying to give you the perspective of what umpires have taught me over the years. Okay. So. Right. A hitter yeah, says, hey, well, let me, let me finish. Let me finish. Was that a strike? Brett Boone looks at the umpire. Was that a strike? He goes, and, and I would most umpires, I, I know you wouldn't. You're more professional, but some. Some rube fell off the turnip truck, says, is that a strike? And most umpires will say, well, was that a hittable pitch? Yep, then it's a strike. That's fair. That's in it. No, foul. That's foul. Right. Okay. I would never say. I think well, you wouldn't I, say when, that. When you're a young player uh, coming up, maybe your first week in the big leagues. Hey, did is that at the top of the zone? It's almost like you're, you're, you're okay. engaging. You want to have a relationship. I think you missed. I that. would never say that. I would say that's not a strike. You've got to be better. Now these now, are old school the, guys. I'm talking about like the well, umpire during your dad's age. They're not going to ask, "Is that a strike?" Okay. They're going to say, "Wait a minute, is that your zone today?" It's going to be more in, not a question form, but a it's kind a negotiation. Of a, 
it's a negotiation. It's a side eye conversation. Right. It's a you're going to tell me that's a strike, Johnny. Then it better be that's, that all day. In that in that right. It's not never going to be. Is that the top of the zone, Johnny? Never. Well, you know that's the, not the, how it is. The ones that drive the umpires the craziest, that drive them the absolutely baddest, is uh, pitchers and catchers because when they're hitting, they'll have a strike zone that they want. And when they're pitching and catching, they want the strike zone to be as big as it can right. be. So, and, so there's a little inconsistency uh, going back and forth. Yeah. And the catchers, you know, the, the catchers really are back there fighting for their guy. I mean, they Which really they are more times. I mean, that's so important. And it, it is such a big part of the game. Those catchers are back there grinding and they, and they've got that constant ear of the umpire. So uh, yeah, it, we, it's an interesting it's an interesting dynamic the, the the catcher, the umpire, the hitter, the conversations, the uh, the the cat and mouse going back and forth, the verbiage. It's really an interesting thing. It's it's kind of fun and to go through those scenarios and and all the altercations I've had and the discussions and how we got to from point A to point B. It's really interesting. Well, you, you're the one who told me I, I didn't know this that there might be two convers two separate independent conversations going on at the same time umpire and the catcher are having a conversation which brett boone has no business being a part of Stay and then of brett boone has a separate conversation with the umpire and that catcher better not say anything to you or the umpire in the middle of your conversation right, right. never and they can be going on simultaneously without a doubt yeah it, that catcher's having a problem with his umpire and and usually because he's not getting the strikes called which is usually benefiting the hitter <laughs> right so by no means am i jumping into the middle you know i'm i'm hey you just keep you calling shut up. you just you just keep going strikes balls and i'm fine with that uh so no i i never get into the middle of a conversation that's their business just like if i have a problem with an umpire or I, I don't want to say problem. If I have a disc discrepancy with an umpire and I think, hey, that's a, this is a strike right. or this ball, the catcher never gets in between. That's between the hitter and the umpire. All right. So do do take us. You, you weren't a big bench jockey. You weren't out there lipping off in the dugout, were you? Bench jockey. What's that from 1967? I'm trying to use old school terms today. Right. No. I, what is a bench jockey? That we, sounds like Ray Boone. <laughs> we were really bench jockeying him, Brett. Well, the I'm hell's a, a little Ray Gra Boone into the program. Gra today. Gramps, what the hell's a bench jockey? Right, were you, would you chirp on the bench? Chirp. Uh, would you? Would you? Would you lip off while you're in the dugout? Uh, it, would you run? Be... Would Brett Boone run his mouth? Very rare situations, and it had to be a pretty upsetting event i went through it had to be a a hor uh, just a horrible horrible call um very rarely though May maybe a couple times a year would i actually come back to the dugout i usually would say my piece out on the field would i come back to the dugout and continue to chirp it, it's very rare for me it, and it wouldn't even be a few times a year for me probably under 10 times in my career did i ever sit there and, ver and and make a scene that I was chirping from the dugout after after the fact. It, okay. it was very rare. We'll see it in baseball. So look, I want to go down this rabbit hole for you for just a minute, if you don't mind. What's your state of mind in that moment where he it, he blew the call? He It's just an egregious call. He blew it. You know it. He knows it. And you are so angry. And so mad and so upset. Describe to me what that's like. Can you give it a, co a comparison to anything the rest of us will go through in life? Um, being wrongly accused. Uh, Is it injustice? That's how you feel. Okay. Yes. You feel you've been accused of something that you didn't do. Uh, it, it is a frustrating point, and I can see the look on your face because you're you know, thinking of it. There, you look level, like someone who's there's, being... le there's levels of it. You know, there's levels of the anger. It's if he missed a pitch and it was close, but damn it, that's been a ball all day, uh, and it's strike three. Man, I'm I'm pissed, but I but I understand. Uh, if it's just outrageous and he just completely blew it in a situation. 
that's the times maybe and and this is far and few between uh very rarely did this happen where I didn't say my piece. I, I'm as angry as I can be without, I never turned around and got in a guy's face and argued and chin, and chin to chin, never. But it was an, it was a, it was an intense argument under my breath, looking down at the ground where he's yelling at me and I'm yelling at him. And we'd get into it pretty much for me to go back to the dugout. It's almost like I was out of control at that point for me to be sitting in the dugout yelling at the umpire. Um, that that whew, that's a, that's true <laughs> anger. Right. I mean, that's as angry as I can be because I would never do that. Once I'm done on the field, I go in, maybe you know, maybe bitch and moan to my teammates, but never right. would I just get back on the top step and start yelling again. That's so, that, that that just doesn't happen very often. I'm really mad if that, like, I'm out of my mind if that ha- if that happens. And we try not to do that. We try to keep it on the field when we come back in. Yeah, maybe a slam of the helmet. A couple teammates will come up to you. Booney, was it as bad as it looked? Absolutely. That, but for me to sit there and continue to yell at him, man, that that's that's different level. Because I, you feel foolish. I, I did. Whenever I was yelling from the dugout, I felt like I'm not a man enough to go back on the field and get in his face. 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 Right. I feel like I'm yelling. I feel like I'm I'm throwing the snowball from behind the trees, and I got a snowmobile running so I can escape. I, so, I'm, and, and the guy, no, no, this, this is guy awesome. that wants to fight. He's right in your face, and he'll hit you right in the mouth with it with an ice ball. Well, the, Sorry the about funny the part of that analogy. <laughs> no, no, that's great because for us as fans, human beings, non baseball players. Non-baseball players, you don't see it in the NFL. You don't really see it in the NBA. You really don't see people just standing there jawing each other in the other, any other sport like we do in baseball. So you talked about being out of control. The, one of the most famous clips of all time is George Brett running out of the dugout Ooh. like a madman. It just loses control. I mean, he is he is a maniac as he goes out there. So we as fans watch that. You know, we would watch Lou Pinella, you know, nose to nose with Jim McKeon, spittle coming out of both their face. They're bumping each other with the bill of their caps. Real people don't get to do that anywhere. That's why it's so fascinating to us. Well, the George, I can really relate to the George Brett incident because people don't understand how big of a deal when you get a and, and I'm not talking about a home run to win a game. If you get a base hit taken away from you, base hits are so hard to come by that when they remove one from you, it sends something through your body that I can't explain. Like you're almost going to faint. You know, you start to shiver and it's like, no, they they can't take it. Back, back in the day, I think they've changed the rule since. You had to play five and a half or you had to play five innings or the stats didn't count. Right, right. So if you if there's a rain delay in the fourth and you're two for two and they don't continue that game, you're that game never existed. And that happened to me one time and it was like, oh, my gosh, are you kidding me? How long is this going to take for me to recover now? I also had I was on the other side of the ledger where we got rained out in the fourth inning. I was 0 for two with a with a pair of strikeouts and they wiped it from the books. And it was like I, I felt like having a party. So the fact that you get a hit and I'm referring to the George Brett, the I've never gotten a, a legitimate home run that landed in the stands. I circled the bases, I got cheered, and then they took it away from me. I couldn't imagine what would be going through my body. Well, and that's the and that's the fun part of this podcast because as a fan, we can't relate. It almost sounds, Brett, like you're talking about a child. You're talking about someone taking your child away. It is. From you. It is. You're, or, you're, or, you're like or, a yeah. You turn into an infant, right? You know. Imagine. At least I did. I, well, I, I don't want to compare a base hit to to Savannah, Jake, or the twins, but it almost sounds like someone kidnapped your baby. Yeah, if you if you take a hit away from you, I mean those those that's fighting words. Yeah, that's, that's the passion we don't get. That's the passion we don't get. And at, at, at any level, I mean, you take a hit away from me in spring training. Ah, oh, it's not going to be as big of a deal, but it's still a big deal. <laughs> I, I earned that thing. Give it to me. 
Yeah. I mean, it, you know, everybody knows the line from Bull Durham. Uh, what's the difference between uh, being in uh, the minor leagues and being in the big leagues? It's one hit a week. Yep. Over the course of a season. That's, that's, a I, I hit a whole million. Uh, and... here, here's, here's the, the worst thing that ever happened to me, I think, in my career. I hit a ball in, in, uh, in Montreal and it hit the foul pole. Eric Gregg's behind the plate. He calls it foul. Pedro Martinez is pitching. So there's a huge arguments. The next, I worked the count. I hit a ball off the wall for a double. The left fielder goes up, hits off his glove, double. They rule it an error. Error. <laughs> so, so I went from a homer to he he called it called it foul, but it was fair. To a double, to a zero for one error. That's the worst of my career. That is amazing, and folks, he remembers that to this day. And the look on his face—if you're watching us on YouTube—the look of disdain, disgust, and sadness, and sorrow on Brett Boone's face is palatable. They made they, they made it up to me though. Wrigley Field, 1998. I had two home runs. Came up windy day. Hit a bomb, uh, 10 feet foul. Guy called it fair. For my third homer of the day, it counted. And to this day, it's every bit of 8 to 10 feet foul. And I saw it with with my naked eyes. I didn't need a replay. Uh, one of the most, I got away with it. <laughs> I felt <laughs> like I got away with I took eight packs of gum from that from that 7-Eleven. And oh, nobody what? ever found out. That's <laughs> still to this day. Ooh, got that homer, and I it was so foul. Anyway. Okay, okay. So, so help me with this then. If the umpire makes a mistake against you, of course you're going to go crazy. Do you recognize when you get one, you get away with one? Oh yeah. Do you keep track of those as well? Do you keep score of those, yeah. or those kind of just go by the wayside? Man, it, I'll tell you. It, I, there's only been a few. I, my first inside the Parker, I'll never remember it, re, forget it. Old Milwaukee Stadium, Kenny Kaiser's behind the plate. Uh, I'm safe easily. I'm a rookie. He calls me out. I go crazy. I don't get thrown out. I hit a home run my next at bat. I bomb. I touch home plate. I look at Kenny. I said, am I safer out on that one? <laughs> and he gave me that look. I almost got thrown, but I didn't. Oh, so um, he must have known he missed it. Probably. Otherwise, I'd throw Ken, you, I would have thrown your butt out. Ken, Kenny Kaiser missed a lot of calls. <laughs> um, yeah, but they're so far and few between. You know, it always comes to mind. They gave me that three home run game in Wrigley that clearly was foul. Uh, the one in Montreal that I got taken away from me from Pedro, uh, that kind of evens that out. The inside the Parker, there had to be something that I made up for where I got away with one. Yeah. When you get away with one, you kind of have that that little kid smile don't on your anything. face. Don't you know, say like, anything. Like, hee, hee, hee. Don't I tell, got mom. Away don't tell mom. Right. But, but man, you take something away from me, now I'm a maniac. Mom Infant. gave me two bags of chips. Don't say right. anything. All right. That's All right, enough. I'm, I'm getting too worked up. Let's move on. Young players, since we're talking about young Brett Boone, um, how much hype did you have when you came up? Good amount of hype, uh, more from a family perspective. I got through the minor leagues real quick, about uh, just under two years, and um, but it was more more family hype. It was you know first Being third, third generation. Gen first third generation. It was the first time it ever happened. Uh, you know, I was a top prospect, but at this, hey, I. Long story short, no, it wasn't the Jackson Holiday type hype. I was. That's this where I'm going. This kid's a number one pick. And he's 20 years old. When I was 20, one, years, 20 old, years old, I was in college. Yeah. I'm a junior in college. You were, playing at, the, in the, you were at the Trojan Barrel. I'm playing at the Pac-10. This right. kid's playing in the big leagues. It, it's amazing to me because I look back at my career and I got to the big leagues quick. And I look at these kids today that, you know, 20 years old. I'm thinking, how would I have reacted when I was 20 years old? Not well, you asked, that, <laughs> you asked that 20-year-old Brett Boone, how, how would I have done? Oh, I'd have killed it. But if I'm realistic, looking back at that 20 year old, I would have been overwhelmed. So I, I really, I tip my cap. I'm amazed when I see these guys uh, playing in the big leagues and and 
and having success at such an early age, it's so hard. And, you know, Jackson Holiday right now, he's going through it. And he's that okay. number one pick in the minor leagues. He's going through a real tough time right now. All right, well, let's get to that because you have uh, two phenomenal players. L.A. De La Cruz is crushing it for your former ball club, the Cincinnati Reds. You were just there. Mm-hmm. Uh, then I have Jackson Holiday over there with so much hype. Uh, give me the thought process on what should fans really have. And I, when I did pre and post game shows, I talk about, I talk about realistic expectations, right? Realistic expert e- e- expectations because. Yeah, I want every rookie to be rookie of the year, and I want them to win the MVP, and I want them to hit 40 home runs. That's not a reasonable expectation. So I look at Jackson Holiday coming up, and there was a while where he just couldn't sniff a hit, and everybody's like, oh, I don't know how good this guy is. You saw with L.A. De La Cruz. Oh, he's really good. Wait a minute. He's, he, he's coming back down to earth. Maybe he's not for real. Oh, look how great he is. Right now, everybody's on his bandwagon. He goes 0 for 20. Everybody's going to jump off his bandwagon. Well, that's sports. <laughs> but I, but no. I want you to give me a right. Uh, let's listen. If you listen to the Boone podcast, we expect you to be a little bit smarter than everybody else. Give me reasonable expectations, would you? Well, I think you look at a Jackson Holiday, and and he set the bar pretty darn high. This kid comes out at eighteen years old. He did, or somebody else did. No, he has set the bar okay. very high. First of all, by being a number one pick, you're okay. going to have all the fanfare right then. People expect a little bit more. You're number one pick. You get paid $10 million, whatever it is. Okay. Expectations go through the roof. That's, that's part reasonable. of it. That's give it. Well, you know what you signed up for. You want right. to be great. You're going to be treated like the great, the good, the bad, the ugly. Uh, he just went out to the minor leagues and it, and I just looked at his numbers. 583 at bats in the minor leagues. This kid at 18, 19, 20 years old, hit 321 combined, 451 on base percentage. For an 18, 19, 20 year old in the minor leagues, it is phenomenal. Who should be at USC in the Pac 12 or something like that. Right. It, if it, you're it's normal. not even, right. It hasn't even signed yet. Uh, that's really, really impressive to do that at, at high professional levels. Comes to the big leagues, all the hype in the world. His dad, who's a good guy we've had on the podcast, I played against him, was a great player in his own right. Yeah, we talked to him right before the draft, didn't we? Yeah, I heard we have a, a, another holiday in the wings that's going to be a great player. Obviously, those numbers at the minor league level, they don't just they don't just happen. You have to be pretty darn good to put those numbers up, especially over 500 or over 700 plate appearances. So he's the real deal. Uh, for whatever reason, he comes to Baltimore. They hit him down in the lineup. He moves from short to second, looks as athletic as, as he's advertised to be, and just gets off to a rough start. And now you're thinking, okay, mm-hmm. I, I know I'm good, but it, rough start, and then it snowballs. And then all of a sudden, you're one for 30. And now you're two for 34, and he got pinch hit for. And they've given him some days off. Um He's 20. He's going to be fine. This kid's going to be, a. I think, a, you never can tell how guys are going to respond in the big leagues. I'll tell you one thing. Jackson Holiday's a big leaguer, and he will be a big leaguer for a long time. Whether he's a batting champ, whether he's an MVP candidate, I don't know. Nobody knows until you get to the big leagues and do it. But the skill set is there. He's going to be a really good player at the big league level. Nobody wants to get off to it. I was talking about this with my son the other day. Jackson Holiday has probably never struggled this much in 34 at bats at any level in his entire nope. life. Um, so he's going through it. And I'll tell you what, he's going to be okay. The thing that's on top of it, he's got 18 punch outs. Right. And this is a guy in the minor leagues that punched out just as much as he walked. He's got two walks to 18 punch outs. In the minor leagues, he had 138 punch outs, 138 walks, which is in this day and age, that's that impressive too, because nobody does that anymore. Everybody's strikeouts are high and their walks are low. Jackson's was pretty even. So he's pressing a little bit. Uh, the expectations, it seems like a really good kid. Yeah. Um, well, that's it, why this is right. going to play it out. It, it whether he's going to start tonight and plays tonight and gets out of it and gets three hits and off to the races and he never he never looks back. That could happen at any time, or he could scuff a little bit more, get sent back to the minor leagues for a little more honing of his, which skills. isn't Just, the worst thing in the world. No, and it's not. And and 
it's not a big deal. Most of us normal people on earth, right? we didn't just get called to the big leagues and, and then we were in the all-star game and everything right, right. was rosy. Not everybody's junior, right? I mean, I, right. I remember I got called to the big leagues and I, you know, I was pretty f- on a fast track and I got called up and, and I remember talking to my teammates afterwards and the, I had some guys, I was signing bats for guys and, and my mind, I was going, I'll never see these guys again. And, and I, I think I even said that I'll never be back in the minor leagues again. Well, fast forward to the following spring training, I'm back in the minor leagues and then I'm in the big leagues and then I'm in the minor leagues again and the big leagues. And the, I, I was on the, I was on the, uh, shuttle, the for shuttle. The first for the first half of the next year. I went up and down three more times. So that's normal. That's what normal that's people normal go through. People Usually you don't just get to the big that's leagues. No, and never, that's what more normal all-stars go through, right? Exactly. Yeah. Right. Exactly. It's very rare that you come to the big leagues at an early age, never to see the minor leagues again. That's a very rare thing, and it's normal to go through that. Like I said, Jackson Holiday might find it tonight, might get three hits. He, 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 he gets some confidence. He finally, by getting some results and he's off to the races and he's this great player for the next 15 years, or that might not happen. And he might have to go to the minor leagues for a little more, not because he needs more minor, but he needs to rest his brain. He needs to get, Hey, I, I just need to take a breath here, get out of the spotlight and just do what I do and get it going again. Get called back up. You never know. You never know. It takes some guys click right away, which is rare, very rare. Most of us need some honing, some learning, uh, some humble pie before we get our footing and become big league players. And that's why I've said this before on the radio that uh, it's this is counterintuitive. When I would go down and do uh, TV games for the Durham Bulls, and I'd sit down, I'd talk to Charlie Montoya, who was a manager, and then I'd go sit down with the farm director afterwards. Uh, we would talk about guys that are killing the ball. Uh, that's great. I want to see him struggle a little bit. Like, why do you want to see him struggle? And I was taught this. There's two things. We, we could do everything we can to the minor leagues. Two things we can't do. We can't replicate the speed of the game in the, in the upper deck. Everything else is the same, but you can't replicate the speed. You can't replicate playing in front of 50,000 fans at Yankee Stadium. And what I was told is I'd rather have my first round draft pick struggle in single A, because you're all going to struggle at some point in life, but I'd rather him struggle at single A, learn how to get out of that out of that funk, than try because it's a lot easier to do it in Winston Salem than it is at Citizens Bank Park. Well, you add that too to to I don't care what anybody says, and I grew up. Uh, I've got about as much amateur time on big league fields as probably anyone that's ever walked the earth. My dad was still in the big leagues when I was in the minor leagues. My whole life was spent at big league stadiums, playing out there, shagging fly balls, hitting in the cage. You can't replicate going to the plate your first time as a big leaguer uh, versus the minor leagues. It's just different. And I rem- I can remember it vividly right now, coming to the plate for the first time in my major league debut at Camden Yards, stepping into the box. And after that first pitch was thrown, stepping out of the box, it's just different. It's different. I, I, you know, I, I used this reference the other day. It's like uh, I'm playing at a local dive bar, and now I'm at Carnegie Hall. There's <laughs> right. something different about it that you just have to go through. It's probably like being on tour. You know, it's probably like you're playing in the on the on the you know this dot com tour and the that dot com tour and in the lower levels. Then all of a sudden, you're at a major tour event it's just different and you can't explain it till you actually get there but once you get a hang of it and and you get past that like you said that third deck well then it's just baseball then it's It's just baseball it's a little bit faster but these guys these holidays the la de la cruz speed isn't a problem for these guys no speed they they've got so they've just got to go through those other nuances and we all have to go through them you taught you mentioned la de la cruz this kid he could be unbelievable. I mean, he's got 15 bags already. He might steal 90 this year. With ease. Uh, his OPS is over is over 1,000. The, the one struggle, and, and a lot of guys deal with that these days, is the strikeout. His ratio is still huge. He strikes out like one every two and a half at bats. Free but when, he's put, when he's putting the ball in play, he's he's electric. Uh, right. that he's total a game changer package, when he gets on base. That total package right there, the ALA. L.A. De La Cruz, 6'7", cannon of an arm, runs like the wind. He's hitting 313 this year. 
Um, but I don't think anybody cares about the strikeouts anymore. Well, it, it, it depends. Everybody strikes out a lot more. You start to start striking out every other at bat. Now you're getting into Joey Botto land. That's a little right. too much. Um, but, but once again, LA de la Cruz, he's, he's 22 years old. We're talking about a baby baby with that frame and that skill set. I mean, he could be potentially the next, uh, Aaron judge on the offensive side, except with speed. Yeah. He's, he's a phenom five tool guy. And it's fun to see if one day, three, four years from now, we're talking about De La Cruz being an MVP and just the best player in baseball. He's got that type of skill set. All right. We're brought back the mailbag folks, the Brett Boone mailbag. Here's the deal. I'm going to remind everybody. Uh, we don't put this podcast behind a paywall. We offer it up for free wherever you get it, on the Odyssey app, Apple, wherever you go. We put it up on YouTube. We do this for free. Only thing we ask is, please leave us a rating. Please leave us a review. Please subscribe to the podcast because that helps the algorithm so more people find us, so more people can download, so more people can be a part of this podcast. If you enjoy it, tell your friends. And again, leave a rating and review. It really does mean a lot to us. Now, in order to get people to participate, because this isn't like my Infinity Sports Network show, where I get to take telephone calls all night from people around the country. People want to go back and forth and have conversations or be part of the podcast with us. So we've opened up Brett's mailbag. If you want to email us, you can. BrettBoone10 at Yahoo.com. BrettBoone10 at Yahoo.com. Uh, we made some little nifty graphics that Brett has been uh, sharing. I've been sharing as well, asking you, to send us a question for the mailbag. And if we use it, Brett is going to send you. Uh, shoelace. No. Oh, uh, 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 baseball I, card. Yeah. Baseball card. Autograph baseball card. Autograph baseball card. So yes, Brett's going to cool. sign a baseball card for you if we use your question <laughs> on the podcast. I, I didn't ask him. I just told him he had to. Uh, Brett Boone 10 at yahoo.com. So the first one we have in our mailbag today is from Kevin Suarto. So Kevin goes, with the A's leaving Oakland and the talk about whether or not Oakland can get an expansion team, and then they're saying the A's are no better than AAA teams. At what point does an expansion lessen the quality of big leaguers and the teams are fielding players that may not be MLB quality? So every time we talk about expansion, Brett, we talk about that the product gets watered down. Is there enough arms right now to expand by two teams to have another 10 starting pitchers when we have teams that don't even have five starters and they go with a, 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 a beginning pitcher. I think so. I think absolutely. It's going to set up the, the, the divisions better too. equally. I think you're going to go back to an East West and, and not have the three divisions. Cause it's going to equal out if you get 32 teams in there, I think absolutely. You know, you go back in the history of baseball and it went from 14 teams. Then uh, in my day, it was 28 teams. Then they expanded two more. Um, I think with the expansion of the baseball and the global impact that baseball is having, the fact that, you know, Dominican's always a huge uh, pool for, for major league talent, but now Japan's becoming a real player. Korea, Cuba, Cuba. Cuba's becoming Venezuela. a real player. So you're taken from such a bigger pool. I think the talent is definitely there to, to uh, suffice to, to, for two more expansion teams. So yes, I think absolutely. Uh, baseball is getting more popular and more popular. It's, it's starting to be played at higher levels in, in more parts of the world right. uh, than, than we're used to. And like I said, the, the fact that Cuba's Cuba's a hotbed and for years and years uh, you weren't getting any Cuban players. Now you're getting Cuban players. Japan's starting to come on the scene. Best player in the world, Shohei Otani from Japan. That was unheard of 20 years ago. And uh, I think you're going to see more and more as time goes on. So yeah, I think we're definitely ready for more expansion. Okay. So that was from uh, Kevin. You've got an autographed baseball card coming your way. Next one we have is from Brandon and Yakima says, Brett, when you get traded in season, how do you cope with the living situation? I'm not, I'm sure you have a pile of personal effects in your former team city. Uh, when do you have time to move? Uh, do you pack your family with you? How does all that work? That's from Brandon to Yakima. Uh, a lot of that went on for me, uh, early in my career. We just talked about that getting get, going on the shuttle. I'm in the big leagues. I'm in the minor leagues. So I got a place in Calgary, Canada. I got a place in Seattle and you're back and forth. It's really a nightmare is what it is. Um, 
Now, once you're a big league level and you're making a lot of money and you get traded, it's really no big deal. You have people to handle and handle that. You get you and your and your and your family and you move on to the next city and your stuff will follow because money is really the price is no object. When you're a minor leaguer and you're going from double A AA to triple A, triple A to the big leagues. Tri Man, you've got leases and you're not making a ton of money. So it's really hard. People that that's behind the scenes of what really goes on. In professional baseball, it's not easy, especially before you you make it. So, uh, yeah, I remember that. I got my lease here. And, hey, could you get – I got called to the big league, so I, I need somebody to cover my lease in AAA because I might be back. And, right. and I'm going back to the big leagues, and now I got to stay in a hotel again because they got me out of that lease because I couldn't afford both because I'm not making enough money. It's a nightmare. But you find How do you get your way. car from place to place? Oh, you don't have a car. You, you find a way. You get – you get to the big league city and you work a deal with a car dealership and you leave them tickets. They'll give you a loaner. That's how you work <laughs> that deal. So, uh, you know, yeah, it's a lot of, it's a lot of behind the scenes stuff. That's, that's a pain in the neck, but it's life things, you know, that, ha that happen in all occupations before you really make it and make a name for yourself. That's, that's kind of being in the bushes. That's what it's all about. And it's, it's, Part of what makes you grow up and, and appreciate when you do make it. Like I said, these guys, when they're making 10, 15, 20 million a year, they get traded. It's like, I'll get myself on the jet and uh, just send my things and, and I'll have people that so, handle my my new. That's what. No, I'm not saying. So me, I'm bougie. saying no, I'm saying today's player. Oh, I thought Brett was being bougie. No, 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 not me. I'm I'm sitting there going, well, today, if you get traded. And let's say you're a 10 year veteran that just got traded and you're making $15 million. What does it matter to you? You don't have the little things. You don't have to worry about penny right. pension. You call your agent. You say, Hey, get me accommodations in my new city. Get all my stuff there. I have people to do that. That's, that's what they do. Well, the I've got to concentrate. I got to concentrate on baseball. Right. And the union has rules that, you know, if I get traded to a new city, they got to put you up for 10 days in a hotel. Um, right. And, and you're yeah. not worried about that. These guys with with the amount of money they're making at the top level, they don't worry about. Well, we'll it'll be handled. Whatever needs to be taken care of will be taken care of. I will have a soft pillow to lay my my head down on. I got a game tomorrow. That's top. What's but, usually... but in the minor leagues, you've already minor signed leagues, it's the a lease. Grind. Yeah, it's a grind. So it's, it's a reward a for getting to the big leagues. OK, but it's it's life things. It's life things that not just athletes go through it. People from all walks of life go through the same thing minor leaguers go through. All right. So now, I'm going to say Brandon Yakima, Yakima deserves an autograph Brett Boone baseball card. You got it. Okay. The last one, I'm not sure. Uh, hey, Booney, this is from Brett with two T's. So he's already starting off on the bad. Ah, uh, Brett, come on. Uh, just wanted to write to say that your podcast is kick ass. I've been a fan of yours since the late 90s, early 2000s. Your perspective as a multi-generational MLB player is invaluable and captivating. Thank you for everything you're doing. Go M's. There's no question to the, to the mailbag, but I liked it. If he could have said, you know, Brett, what's it like hanging out with Rich all the time? I would have for sure given him the baseball card. But is that worth, do we give him a baseball card? Well, you're supposed to only read questions, but yeah, why not? I said, I gotta, why not? I'm giving him a baseball card. <laughs> not my cards, go. they're yours. There you go. All right, so he's uh, in. He's in. He's in. That's what you got to do, folks. Uh, send it to Brett Boone Ten at Yahoo.com. We read it on the air. You'll get an autographed Brett Boone baseball card. All right, that's gonna wrap everything up for the podcast for today. What do we have coming up? What do we have coming up? Uh, the next few we've got. Mike Blowers uh, from the Seattle Mariners will be okay. coming up. Oh, and we've got a special one next week. I, 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 I just remember this. Mike Cameron, May 2nd, 2002, hit four home runs in a game. Mike and myself went back-to-back -back twice in the first inning. Um, friend of mine, friend of yours, friend of the program, uh, John Rooney, who's now – a voice with the with the St. Louis Cardinals. He does the play by play for the Cardinals. He was on the call for the Chicago White Sox. He's been on the podcast before, so he's going to be a part of this panel. It's going to be Mike Cameron, Jim Parquet, who is a pitcher in that game, who relu reluctantly uh, agreed to come on the show. He gave <laughs> he gave up four he's homers that day. Four homers that day. He gave up one to me, three to Cammy. He's coming on. 
and we're going to have John Rooney, who was on the call there. for the Chicago White Sox. I wanted to get the perspective from the booth. What was going through his mind? How did this compare? Obviously, Rooney's been doing this for a long time. How does this compare with all-time greatest moments? For me as a player that hit two and at the end of the game felt like I had a bad game because my teammate <laughs> hit four, uh, I, I, I want his perspective. So that's going to be a cool one. I'm looking forward to that. That'll be out the day that it, on the on the anniversary. So that'll okay. be out a Thursday. Uh, and then we'll just we'll keep grinding. I you haven't got past guys? that right now. Oh, All Mark right. Grant. Mark Grant's going to be coming up. Voice of the okay. Padres. Uh, we're going to get his early season Padre perspective. How that how that uh, National League or National League West is West. looking from his perspective. So other than that, we we'll keep them rolling. All right. By the way, uh, for those that are watching, you haven't lifted up high enough. For those of you watching on YouTube for your shirt. Yeah. Which this, which shirt is that? Because I only see like the top this, part of the, this this turning two with Booney. There you go. Come on. All right. I like the shirt. Uh, that's going to do it for the podcast for today. Again, don't forget, rate, review, tell your friends, and subscribe uh, to the Boom Podcast. Until we get together next time, thanks, everybody.